In part one of this lecture, I introduced the concept of environmental health, arguing that it has a broader perspective than that of biomedicine or public health, as well as introducing concepts of environmental justice, lay knowledge, politics and economics. In part two, I focused on occupational health as a subsection of environmental health and provided a case study on asbestos regulation, which demonstrates some of the broader concepts introduced earlier. In part three of this lecture, I am going to examine social movements and what I call the democratization of health. This involves exploring another case study, this time on the breast cancer movement, in order to investigate how different kinds of knowledge can shape understandings of environmental health issues. The term social movements is used to refer to group collective action, which undertakes radical action and protest. Social movements occur when large numbers of people come together, sometimes formally, but more commonly the initial origins are informal, in order to bring about some kind of social change. Social movements are generally loosely organized. They often don't have a formal structure or rules or hierarchies, and they are sustained over a period of time through a set of shared values. They operate, initially at least, outside of formal political structures. Because social movements aim to bring about social change, they most often focus on political or social issues. Health social movements usually seek to democratize science and insert into policy processes that claim to rely primarily on expert science, other values and concerns about health. These are those of civil society, local activists or sufferers' values in relation to the ways in which science is being interpreted and policy formulated. There are many health social movements that you may know of, such as the anti-tobacco movement or the anti-asbestos movement or the fight for affordable antiretrovirals for people living with HIV and, as we shall hear about in today's lecture, the breast cancer movement. In part two of this lecture, I asked how important is economics and politics in relation to health and disease. Looking at the work of social movements helps us to answer this question. Health social movements have been known to challenge political power as well as scientific and professional authority. They have shown that non-biomedical factors are significant in relation to illness and disease. For example, in relation to asbestos disease, Social movements have argued that political and economic priorities have led to the widespread occurrence of asbestos cancer. The work of social movements has also opened up new lines of inquiry in relation to health and its non-biomedical drivers. Health social movements have also tried to reshape scientific inquiry, and they have done this in several ways. By pointing to the contested nature of scientific evidence and by encouraging debate over definitions, causes, treatment and prevention. In so doing, they have challenged the top-down, expert-driven and individually based focus of biomedicine and have, at times, been successful and brought about enhanced awareness within health systems and changes in policy. Social movements have also, as I have suggested earlier, tried to democratize health. They have done this in several ways, by revealing an interplay between global health and local civil society. In other words, they have connected community issues happening in different places and shown how these are often transnational or global struggles. By pointing to how health inequalities are often based on factors such as race, gender, class, sexuality, and by working to eliminate or redress this. And by showing how science is not always neutral and can be used to promote dominant economic and political interests. McCormick calls this the Iron Triangle between companies, governments and researchers, in which these three categories of people work together through regulation, through funding patterns and through prioritization to co-produce what is then considered to be expert cutting-edge science. Democratizing health movements have shown how this scientization of politics can exclude local citizens from decision-making. So activists in social movements often seek to contest large-scale financial, industrial and government interests and to advance alternative understandings of the problem. As social movements and activists confront these dominant framings, these perspectives of government and industry, they too have to engage with the science and critique it on its own terms. In other words, they too have become proficient in science debates and, 
As they try to reshape science, so science also reshapes the movement. Turning now to the environmental breast cancer movement as a case study. This movement began in the 1990s in the United States of America. Prior to this, cancer was viewed as a private experience and something that wasn't spoken about very much. Indeed, for people of my parents' generation, even saying the word cancer was difficult. Cancer was something you dealt with as an individual by having a positive attitude, by making some lifestyle changes and through the support of your family. For many years, the biomedical model focused on individual factors such as diet, exercise, age, age of childbirth and genetics when dealing with cancer. As Brown argues, based on work amongst cancer sufferers in poor neighborhoods in Philadelphia, this is experienced as blaming the individual for their behavior and making them personally responsible for having contracted cancer. The breast cancer movement focused on the role of toxins in the environment and their health effects and pushed for much greater regulation and decision making in relation to these toxins. In other words, it pushed to change the way cancer was thought about, from a personal disease to an illness which is both politically charged and a collective illness. It worked to put cancer on the public agenda in the USA and to link the incident of disease to feminist and environmental debates. The breast cancer movement also pushed science in new directions. Its members engaged in scientific and public debate, which examined the causes and etiology of cancer. In these debates, activists raised questions about the role of the precautionary principle and the burden of proof, and they kept asking things about the environment. In so doing, the movement was aiming to achieve four things. First, it wanted to create public awareness about the ways in which environmental factors contributed to breast cancer. It did this in part by showing the steady increase in breast cancer. That, one in 20 women had suffered in 1964, but one in eight experienced this in 2006. And it argued that this was because of the increase in chemicals in the environment. Secondly, it wanted more research into the relationship between breast cancer and the environment. Thirdly, it wanted to bring about new policies which would prevent environmental contributory cases of cancer. And lastly, the breast cancer movement wanted to enhance local participation in research on cancer. In Long Island, New York, one woman noticed that her friends were all being diagnosed with breast cancer, and she began to undertake what is known as popular epidemiology. She and her friends were aware of the debates about the environment, of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, and of feminist debates and protests. And they wondered about these things as they gathered together in each other's homes. As they poured water, they held it up and wondered what was in it. They thought about the spraying of pesticides in the neighborhood and if these could cause breast cancer. They then sought to find out how extensive cancer was in their neighborhood, and they went from door to door asking about it. They formed an organization to handle the information they were generating. They worked together to identify contributory factors and developed alliances with scientists. These citizen science alliances created a whole series of new interactions, which included promoting public awareness, undertaking scientific investigations, mobilizing non-activist scientists at science conferences, connecting up with politicians on environmental issues, and producing a bill to fund research into breast cancer, leading in turn to a government public hearing on breast cancer. And so, the social movement on breast cancer was born. They ensured that they had supportive members on research advisory boards, that they held regular fundraising events, and that they constantly engaged with the media and had its attention. Overall, they worked in a very networked way, creating new interactions between activists, sufferers, researchers, health and environmental scientists, politicians, policymakers, and funders. In 2002, despite all their work, the networking, the popular epidemiology, and the citizen science alliances, a study showed that there was very little evidence of the link between chemicals in the environment and breast cancer. Since then, Further research has been undertaken and the collaboration with scientists has continued. Activists have shifted their focus from the disease itself and the collection of evidence to improving support and services to developing a broader agenda on environmental exposures and illness. There is no conclusive evidence, but boundary crossing events were important. The citizen science alliances had several significant outcomes. 
These citizen science alliances reshaped scientific thinking, and advances were made in breast cancer etiology. And the activists also learned a lot more about the challenges of studying the environmental links to breast cancer. These alliances broke down many of the conventional divisions between local people and scientists, and this shaped public struggles over knowledge production efforts. It created a framework for health activism, namely that the personal is scientific and the scientific is political. This clearly draws on feminist epistemology, and as one woman commented on hearing that her friend had breast cancer, I refuse to accept that this is natural and inevitable. So where does this leave us? Environmental health is about producing a body of knowledge that takes different understandings of the body and experiences of the environment into account. It is important because of the ways in which it challenges dominant framings, exposing how economic and political interests might shape government regulatory approaches, and by including non-biomedical and environmental dimensions to a problem. In so doing, it argues that no one category of people can claim to have a valid explanation or what Longino calls a privileged relationship to truth. It aims to straddle the scientific and non-scientific domains by bringing lay people and experts closer together and by connecting up activists with policymakers and health officials who can make change happen. It links personal experiences of illness with collective experiences and by so doing politicizes these experiences, drawing connections between institutions, politics and economics and about thinking about who makes decisions about causing, preventing, or treating disease. In asking whose values matter, whose experiences count, and whose ways of knowing are important, environmental health struggles for a broader understanding of health and for introducing the idea of social justice. As the research into breast cancer and environmental pollution showed, there are no neat and tidy answers. There are no clear solutions with obvious directions. But working with communities and undertaking participatory research means that environmental health is situated within rather than removed and distanced from other bodies and society. And its emphasis on partial perspectives, subjectivities and political knowledge can bring about social change and greater health benefits for all.